So it's Friday night. It's been a crazy week. The rain is falling. Storm Callum is coming in. And this, this is the Mastering Portrait Photography Podcast. Well, hello there. How are you? I hope you've had a good week. Well, it's been pretty hectic here. Um, I was just going through my notes and looking at uh, what we've been up to in the past week. And it's been one of those weeks where, frankly, our feet haven't touched the ground. So just to give you a quick overview of how the last 10 days or so have been, I'm using 10 days rather than seven because I think it's been nearly two weeks since I last sat down and did anything with the podcast. So in that time, we've had one wedding pitch, which luckily we won, which is always good. Eight portrait shoots of various types, one training day, three seminars and presentations. We've relaunched one Mastering Portrait Photography website. I've managed to clock up one 50th birthday. And then as the icing on the cake, we've won two national awards. So as you can see, quite a week, even for this studio, which is always fairly busy. Uh, so a few bits and pieces then. The portrait shoots were a mixed bag, ranging from really beautiful family shoots all the way through to yesterday. I was up in Sheffield working with a charity, taking portraits of people who are who have supported living. So um, learning difficulties of one sort or another. Uh, and the charity helps them live uh, a very, very normal life. Uh, just one of the most rewarding things we do, actually, is we go and take portraits uh, for this charity. It just so happened that it was up in Sheffield and it was a beautiful day. So much as you might think going up north would be wet and cold, it was anything but. It's far wetter and far colder down here today. Uh, we've also had around a training day. So a lovely guy called Roger came down. We arranged some models here uh, and spent the entire day ensconced in the studio, just going through ideas of lighting and posing and how to... Um, how to manage the shoot so you've the whole time you're creating new and exciting images really good fun the models are incredible uh, georgia in the morning and jessica in the afternoon and it's great as a photographer when you start to see as you're coaching someone you start to see the images just get better and better and better as their confidence grows because an awful lot of this game is in fact about confidence uh also managed to relaunch uh, the mastering portrait photography website those of you who are already members of MasteringPortraitPhotography.com will have noticed uh, that it has changed completely. I was never really happy with the first platform. It was great uh, as a development tool for putting everything together and proving the concept. And we, we did have it up and running. It had members on it and the forums were alive. But I could never quite get the formatting and the structure how I thought it should really be. So uh, last week... Uh, on top of everything else, we ran uh, the final stages of converting the website over, bringing all of the members across, bringing all of the final content across, checking that it connected all to the bank accounts correctly and all of the testing that goes with it. But, oh, it's so nice now. It's so lovely uh, because finally the website looks the way I always hoped it would do when we set out on this adventure. And now it can grow and evolve. We've got total control over everything. Um, the forums are fast. The search engine's brilliant because it's a proper associative or a relevance-based uh, search engine where you can it properly. You don't have to be entirely accurate on your keywords. It will find all sorts of variations on the words as you search, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, of course, I also managed to turn 50, which was quite an event. Uh, well, at least <laughs> it was quite an event. It wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be quietly glossed over, but it seems that everybody else wanted a party uh, far more than I did. Uh, but uh, a wonderful day. I was actually working. I was working at the Manoir on the evening of my birthday, uh, which is Raymond Blanc's uh, hotel and restaurant. And uh, the man himself did, in fact, uh, sing me happy birthday, which is always lovely. Uh, the guys down there were super lovely. I mean, they are super lovely anyway, uh, but they made a real fuss of me and uh, birthday cards. There was a cake, Benoit Bland baked a cake uh, that they presented to me, a little gift. Uh, and then obviously to top it all off, Raymond Blanc sent me happy birthday. If you ever get a chance to go and eat or stay at to the Manoir, please do so because they're just the nicest people on the the planet uh, and then over the weekend was the meet the masters weekend which i've talked about in previous podcasts it's uh, the weekend of seminars and workshops but also on the sunday night is the master photographers association awards evening 
And it's absolutely amazing. 300 people in a room, uh, some of the best photographers, not just in the UK, but in the world, uh, all there having an absolute ball. Uh, and uh, the awards were uh, announced. And we've been very lucky. I've won two this year, um, which, so if, if you don't know, uh, I, these days I spend more time judging than I do entering. So the past five years, I haven't entered any of the competitions because I was both uh, for a while chair of the Master Photographers Association, uh, but I've also been a judge one of the national judges and that's a real privilege to sit on a judges panel with some of these photographers these are elite photographers and i get to sit there with them as one of that group uh judging and uh scoring images from all over the planet and i absolutely love it but this year I really, really, really wanted to take a year out of the judging, apart from the fact we've been massively busy. Uh, but I also wanted to see if I could still do it. And it turns out we can. Uh, so two national awards. We won uh, portrait or studio portrait photographer of the year with a beautiful image of this incredible guy called Alex Bellini. He's an explorer. He's a lecturer. He's a coach. Um, and one of the most intriguing and interesting people I've ever had the privilege to have in front of the camera. Uh, and a portrait of him taken in the studio uh, that he came and did a session with us earlier in the year. Uh, that won uh, Studio Portrait Photographer of the Year. And then also we won uh, Dog Portrait Photographer of the Year with a uh, beautiful picture of our own studio mutt who's here. Uh, we took the picture, myself and Jake, our son, took the picture for Sarah as a birthday present, I think. I can't remember if it's birthday or Christmas, but a gift anyway. Uh, we only managed to get one shot. The dog is not the best at sitting still and looking at the camera. Uh, if you have a tip bit out, which is the typical way of attracting a dog's attention, then of course our dog comes running straight towards you to eat the said trip tip bit. So uh, an interesting... Uh, an interesting image to win a competition with. So Dog, Portrait Photographer of the Year. But what a wonderful thing. And then over the same weekend, uh, I spent some time doing some seminars. Uh, first seminar was with James Musselwhite, who's a photographer, who's, who's not only do I love his work, I think his work's beautiful, but I also love the man. He's a brilliant guy. He's very funny. Uh, it's always great to do a presentation with him or to do or to interview him as I have on the podcast previously. I just think he's, he's amazing. So that was a real thrill. And then later on in the afternoon, just before the awards, I spent uh, a few hours talking to people about post-production. So photoshopping and how to make photoshopping efficient, how to make photoshopping straightforward, uh, but how to bake it into your workflow. So it doesn't become this really onerous sort of thing. And then, uh, and that's that, and that's, that's catches us up. So in this particular podcast, um, I'm going to take one of the seminars. It's the seminar that myself and James Musselwhite did live. We did a live Q and a at the meet the masters day, which is brilliant. A room full of people. Now, let me just explain. Uh, we did this Q and a in the main atrium of the, um, meet the master's day so the noise levels go up and down a little bit it's hard to hear some of what's going on uh, we had enough mics to mic myself and james but we couldn't obviously mic the auditorium there weren't enough mics to do that so occasionally the questions get a little bit lost in the noise but hopefully you'll hear what was going on you'll hear certainly hear the answers um and then you towards the end of it you'll also hear the noise getting gradually louder because one of the great things there we had some amazing photographers speaking at meet the masters and one of those was kelly brown from australia and uh, she was talking at the same time as us but she finished her seminar just a little bit before we did and you can hear that everyone suddenly surges into our seminar uh, and the noise levels just go up and up and up and up uh, but hopefully you'll find this enjoyable hopefully you'll find this informative um, and uh, thank you again to the master photographers association for inviting us to come along and chat about this wonderful world of portrait photography and we join the conversation just after the first question has been asked. And that first question is, what is the signature shot that a client is always likely to buy? Mum and dad, kids in the middle, laying on the floor, looking at the camera, smiling, no emotion. Just that. Sells every time. Has that inspired everyone? <laughs> it's the dead no. sigh from him. Uh, a signature shot? Well, I, you see, I call it a safety shot, which, oh, is, right. which is much more negative. So I'm like, I like what you say. No, yes. darling, this is my signature shot. And I, I will say this to someone. I do. <laughs> All right. I don't. I would say this is my safety shot. In this shot, you're going to look amazing. Yes. But I like the idea of it being a signature shot. It sounds like art. Yes. Whereas in I, fact, I that from you, well, in, in fact, it's just a diversion away from the fact that, damn it, I don't know how to light you. <laughs> but if I sit you there, that might just work. Yes. And I have a high probability. Uh, it, it depends if I'm in the studio or if I'm outside. Okay. Uh, if I'm outside, uh, shot of, there's a little patch in our back uh, yard. <laughs> they call it a yard. 
this is a, is this a grade two listed garden? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's designed by a world famous architect and has people come from all over the world, but it's still my backyard. And uh, if you sit on the steps there, there's a patch of sunlight that shows through the trees, a light, that is skylight. It lights yeah. really well, tip the chin back, look into me, catch lights are in the right place, shadows are in the right place. There's an alleyway that brings light through, so you get hair light and rim light, proper face light, chins up, so this bit here is all stretched out. I'm looking down, bish bash bosh, safety. Or, what a piece of art, yes. <laughs> I'm, I am now taking your approach, I like that, so it's much, much more marketing, what about you? Who shoots babies here, right? So like, like my, I guess my go-to shot for new parents who are often tired and not feeling their best and not having that much self-confidence is two, I do two shots. I do like, they come in the shoot and they go, oh no, just the baby, I don't want the family kind of thing. And you're like, okay, but the family's the thing that's gonna knit it together and make a big sale for me, okay? So you've got to find a way to flatter them when they're not models and they're not perfect and they're not paid for to do, <laughs> to do a shoot, right? My two, sh two go-to shots are like, I'll, I'll approach them and say, look, I just need a shot with your hands in. It doesn't have to be you, just a shot with your hands. And do it on a black background, light over, rim light the baby, the baby's asleep, and just hold the, hold the head and hold the bum and the back. So the dad's on this side holding the bum and the back. I always put the dad at the bum end, always gets a laugh. And I put the mum, the more responsible one, at the head end, <laughs> like that. And, and then you just zoom in and you just shoot the baby asleep, laying on the back against the dark background, black and white. They're in the picture, it's a family picture. The other one, if the baby's a little bit older, maybe anything from sort of three to three months up where they can hold their head a little bit. If they're awake, just pop them up on mum and dad's shoulder and turn mum and dad away from the camera and have them stood either side. And then you joke with them, oh, it's a shot of the back of your head. It's probably your best side, dad, whatever. I don't know, have a joke like that, if, you, if it's appropriate to have a joke. And then hopefully get a really cute expression of the, of the baby. Again, their faces are not in the picture, but it's still when, a family when's picture. When's it not appropriate to have a joke? Well, when it's inappropriate. Yeah, I get that. I understood the definition of the word appropriate. <laughs> what I was hunting for was like those moments when you look at the dad and think, nah, shit, I'm not going to be funny today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I photograph mainly in central Portsmouth next to the football stadium. There's a lot of big tattooed men who you genuinely don't joke with. Are those big men with tattoos or tattooed men with big tattoos? Big tattoos, both. All uh, right. Yeah, both. And you find they don't have a sense of humour? They, uh, okay, why is this now turning into... Like, <laughs> because only two people put their hands up for questions, so I'm padding the answer. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. In answer oh, three, to your question. We've got three questions. Yeah. Oh, well, let's finish this one. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. That's those are my two go-to shots for for parents that because I like um, when we do these things when we sort of share information. I like to share information that's like practical that you use day to day. Right. So just going back to the point a little bit. Most of my mums and dads who walk through the door aren't super confident. A lot of them have had the vouchers bought for them as a gift, so they feel obliged to take it, and they're not going in going, yippee, this is the most yeah. wonderful thing, we've become a family. It's like, oh God, we've got to do this because mum told us to have a picture yeah. taken. So it's just trying to reinforce that confidence in them that you're going to make them look as good as possible and also flatter them with, with sort of alternative views on things that they wouldn't have thought of, if yeah. that makes sense. Let's go to another question because I, I feel gonna, like I'm rambling. I was going to add oh, something sorry. onto that. No, I was going to add a practical point onto it. Yeah. which is you ask, what's the one? And in fact, using the term safety, our studio safety is a variety. So the more variety you can pump into the session, the more angles and different finishes, particularly if you can make it coherent. So not randomness. Mm. Um, so our, our biggest selling frame at the moment is a multi-image frame. It sits on a wall, it's 30 inches square, and it sells for 1,200 quid. And it sells, and sells, and sells, and sells but it's shot for it, that's my safety. So I, don't, I very rarely get asked to create one shot. If I do that, they're gonna buy a 12 inch frame, that's a couple of hundred quid, yep. well, four or 500 pounds, but it's still not gonna make me the big bucks. So actually my job is in the hour and a half, two hours I have, two hours I have, is to clatter my way through it, and everything James said is right, but you do it repeatedly. Constantly looking for another angle, another angle, and we've had this conversation. Looking, sorry, for the podcast, I'm looking at Rach, <laughs> some of the yeah. guys, where uh, you have to have the balls to say that didn't work. So don't feel obliged that every shot has to be a hero. Oh right, yeah, yeah. yeah. When you're yeah. shooting, you can actually say that's not. I didn't get that right. You always, it's always me. I didn't get the lighting right. I didn't get your angles right. I don't think you're going to like this shot so much. I, I just don't think I'm doing my job right and move on because it has two effects. One is you're not doing that thing which we all do when we start out, which is, I hate, it. I hate admitting that's not a good picture. 
You say things like, oh, that's really beautiful, let's do something else. I think it's all right to say that's not a great shot. I'm just looking around the room. The second, the second thing is that in doing that, you heighten the perception of the good shots. A designer taught me this when we were doing a portfolio, uh, we were doing a portfolio build, a design, and he helped me. And I wanted every hero shot I had in our portfolio. And he came back with his designs and he hadn't done that. What he'd done was have a big hero shot and then some shots that I thought were all right. I mean, I didn't give him anything that's rubbish. And then another big hero shot and then he flicked through a few more. And I said, could we not put all the heroes in? And he said, yeah, if you do that, by the time I get to page five, every shot's average. You need to show your client what's a great shot and what's still a good shot, but not necessarily the shot they're going to buy. And that way you can lead them in. Seriously, we do this. We pick out the heroes in the reveal. And so we have all of the images up and all of the hero images have PW at the end of them. You can see it on the file name. And people do this. They go, oh, which ones did Paul like? And they go into the frame. They always end up in the frame. And that way we uplift our sales. And so we get good sales. And that's my safety. It's not one shot. It's a thought process about building a frame. And when, you, when you show those multi frames, I've seen the multi frames in your studio, do you actually show them a mock up of the yep. images in that frame yep. in the, as part yep. of the slideshow? Yep, 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 and, and yep. Right. Lots of them. <laughs> so, uh, oh, sorry, the question says I've got a producer in the front row who's doing this signal at me, which means repeat. Uh, the question is, um, do we show the mock-ups effectively of the frames? Yes, of course we do. Because our clients, unless your client is a designer, are not designers. And so we show all of the frames we would like to sell in room sets or in frame sets, whatever they may be, uh, so that they can could they touch it, feel it, smell it, take it home. They can't take it home, they can buy it there and then, but you get the gist. Have I answered? Is that all? Are you anything more to add? No. Yes, no. Brilliant. No. no. Good. More quick, because someone said they had three questions. We well, just spent right, like, yeah. however yeah, long that how was long on we one. On two? <laughs> two, but oh. Damien ate about half an hour into our time. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Question one, when are you two going to do your own comedy double act? Sorry, yeah. you're in it. No, you're, no, no, you're no, participating it's, it's in called, it now. The title of the show is called, oh, sorry, for the, Rachel is still doing the, uh, the question was, when are we going to have our own comedy show? Um, yeah. This is it. I'm going to have to get used to doing that. I'm going to use the microphone in a minute. Sod Google. Yeah. Um, and the title would be, But I Digress. Yes. Friday nights, Channel 4. Eight they out of finished. ten cats digress or something. They finished, I think. Oh, have they? Do you want yeah. a microphone? Let's get a mic on. <laughs> Oh, but this is good podcasting. Just is silence it? and us. Yeah, they finished. Yeah, let's do it. That's called a sound bed. Yeah. Hello. That's better. Right. So you have, uh, you have two questions. Yes, You've done two. What's three? Um, oh, uh, announce it to everyone. How do you actually balance? Into the microphone. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they just give you tips to hold. <laughs> I don't do this very much. Come on, let's go. No one's listening no, to you. Let's so go. It's just you and me. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. How do I stop myself editing until three in the morning? Okay. That's a is good question. What you need in this instance is someone who regularly does seminars on processing. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. I'm this show isn't even scripted. <laughs> what you need. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Rachel's looking at our sound recording unit with a degree of curiosity. It's working. Um, there's no easy answer to that. You will always do more and more and more. And then you'll come back in the morning and realise you screwed it up because you were tired and do it all over again. Um, you have to find an approach. Can you hear me on this microphone? This microphone? Thank you. I'm holding two microphones weirdly. Oh, okay. Um, there is no easy answer, there's no right answer. You have to find that thing, there's a, there's a point, and you just keep testing different amounts of processing until your client still buys it, and you don't have a lot of rework to do when they do. So our workflow in our studio, and James is the same, is the guys in the studio do their damnedest to stop me being involved any more than they have to, because I'm rubbish, essentially. I'm quite good at taking a picture, I'm quite good at an edit, but if I'm involved in the workflow, clients are not getting pictures until quite a long way down the line. That sounds like me. So we have, we have a very basic process, which is once I hand the images over, I better not see them again. Except if they order like a 36 or 50 or 60 inch print, in which case, yes, it comes back to me because I'm then, we're just going to be really big on a wall and the cost of failure, the cost of a mistake is huge. We better make sure that's right. 
but the cost of the, the edit is also quite big. So to inject it back into my workflow is also pretty big. So we're trying to find this balancing act the whole time. We've just found this point where there's enough editing done, and that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon, um, to get it in front of the client and for the client to buy it 99% of the time. Because most of our clients don't buy big pictures. They buy this multi-image frame, but the biggest image in there is 11 inches big. Well, yeah, that's fine. A the, the, the tiny little dust spot's not going to show up. Oh, this leads to... Oh, look oh, at that. This is, this is this seamless. <laughs> This is my job, isn't it? So, you hand over your editing. How do you go from being a one man band where you were doing everything the editing, the laying out, the design, the ordering, absolutely everything to that? What is the point that you actually let them control? and hand it over to someone else that you're going to have to pay when you're not even giving yourself a salary. You want that one? Mm -hmm. It was addressed to you. Ah. Oh, no, it wasn't. I don't think it was. Don't, don't, don't go hiding in the back over there. <laughs> this is going to be a very weird seminar if, if James keeps running on. I'm the Q, you're the A. Yeah, no, that, that was for you though, because you're... Well, the, the reality from our studio is I had to. It wasn't an optional thing. So I do the post-production, but I do not do image selections. Those of you, know, if you know us, right? There's people in here who've known us a long time. So you all go, yeah, we know this piece of information. Could you tell us something new? But people are asking. So um, I don't trust myself to pick the right images. And I've, I've talked about this a lot because as a photographer, I'm heavily invested in both the picture I took and the relationship I now have with that client. So if I had to lie in a puddle, you know those beautiful reflection shots you get where the wide angle lens and the camera's down on the ground and it's right in the water and you get back up and you look like you've pissed yourself, right? And that is just excitement, ladies and gentlemen. I was in the dry. <laughs> but you know, you know, this is going to be an awful podcast. Uh, I'm going to leave that in though. Uh, because... Um, I'm not qualified, so if I've had to invest time, energy and emotion into an image, I think that image is great. And as all of us have just discovered, when you put those in for judging, the judges don't see it. How do they not know how much I struggled for that image? How? That image is my, that's the hardest I've ever, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's exactly the same with your clients. They don't see it. And you can, you, can, you can do some work, you can say, this shot I've just created is amazing because, and then pray you got it right. But Sarah looks at the images and she just looks at me and goes, why did you bother? <laughs> and that's that. So it was, it's brutal and there have been moments of us not speaking for an hour or two. Um, but on the whole, I never go back to the rejected images. Sarah is amazing at it on two levels. One, she knows what makes a woman look good and she's a woman. So that's helpful. Whereas what a guy thinks makes a woman look good, it's not always the same thing. You know? <laughs> just saying. It might be to a guy, but the guy isn't buying it, the girls are. So there's that. Uh, there's also the fact that Sarah's a marketeer. So she always thinks the following thing. Will the client like it? And if we put this up with our brand's images, does that sit correctly with our brand? And if she can answer yes to those two questions, it gets into the shortlist, and then she drills it down until uh, I will shoot 500 images in a shoot, and 40 will go in front of the client. And, that's, and we've been one to 10 ratio for as long as I can remember. And that means there's some amazing images in the bin. I've been back and some of them have won competitions. So I know there's amazing stuff in the bin, but my job isn't that. My job is to make sure the client has great images and that the business thrives. So the answer is you have to think about it from a business point of view, not an artistic one, because you have to let go, you have to. In, in the broader sense of business as well, in terms of expanding the business and sort of uh, delegating work, someone told me years ago that you make a list of all your jobs, everything you do in business, you make a list of it from top to bottom, and at the top of the list, you put the stuff that you really enjoy doing, the stuff that you would do for free, and it goes all the way down to the bottom of the list to the stuff that you really hate doing. The stuff at the bottom of that list is the first job you give to your first trainee, or the first job that you look to outsource. So, like, for me, editing and cleaning, they're two of the things that I'm looking to get rid of, so that we would employ a cleaner, and we'd outsource a lot of our wedding edits because I don't enjoy doing them. And, they, and for that little bit of return, it's not like 
will it come back better? It's more, no, that's three hours I can spend with my kids. A couple of hours I can spend, like, watching fucking Paw Patrol. Or, you know, Peppa Pig. So it's worth it. Bring back those edits. There you go. What's the sort of thing? Repeat that question. So the question is: the question is, uh, what do we do on a regular basis in terms of marketing, repeat stuff, regular cycle stuff, brand building, and everything else? So this is something that's constantly changing and evolving. Um, from even like the last seven years that I've been self-employed, my marketing strategy is night and day from 2011 to what it is now, and I've realised that what my strategy is at the moment to get as many of the right clients through my door is it is little and often social media posts and it is trying to find stuff that people have a connection with so just recently if you'll go onto like my closer photography facebook page it's just little videos shot on my phone of me and my wife at a shoot 60 seconds messing up fluffing our lines she just not, no, no, no relevant information that's of any value to anyone, but what people see is a face of the business and a connection to the business. And also, for all of the customers that visited me seven years ago, it pops up in their feed, reminds them that I'm still there, and we'll often get maybe a couple of messages in the week where they go, oh, I thought of you the other day. We haven't had a shoot in ages. Or oh, I thought of you the other day. I recommended you to someone. So it's not a case of like, you know, whereas like maybe seven years ago, it was a much more direct form of marketing. It's much more subliminal now, and I think the most important thing you can do as a new startup or as a reboot of your current business is get a handle on all your social media feeds. That's my advice. That's very good advice. I'll take it. Because I'm not so good as him. <laughs> I watch James's stuff come up all the time, and it's genius. And I always think, oh yeah, I should book a shoot with James. Uh, oh, <laughs> then, you see, then you see the work and you go, ah, oh, actually. Well, no, okay, actually, I've, 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 I've booked a fitness instructor to get myself in shape as a wrestler. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not a newborn. And so I think the way of getting in front of your camera is some ink and some abs. So, so and, and, and to, that, to, the, to that point as well, there's quite an interesting point in that I've become so obsessed with the wrestling side of my business and so good at marketing that, that it's almost isolated me from the core values of my business, which is families and babies. They almost feel like I don't do it. And when I got my fellowship a couple of years ago, I got a load of messages from people saying, well, we'd love to see you, but we don't think we can afford you now because you're achieving so much stuff and you're, and you're at that level now. How can we possibly afford you? Which is a great reputation to have, but ultimately it's cost me business in the long run. That's not the best way to promote qualifications at an MPS sports event. <laughs> yeah. I've just realised. Well, why did they ask me to do this? Ooh. Because it'd be fun. Okay, go for it. You talk for a bit. All right, I'll talk for a bit. Uh, I can tell you bits about the marketing with a degree of confidence, but without Sarah here, who actually has the strategy in her head, a little bit more tricky. Um, we've had one strategy throughout, which is, I've kind of come to it as uh, tip of the tongue marketing. So we can't make people want to shoot necessarily, but when they do, we better be on that list. Just had a newborn, kids going to school, kids are leaving school, kids are engaged. Kids have had their first baby, and so the cycle continues. And what we want is when that happens, for someone to go, who do we know as a photographer? Oh, there's that guy, what's his name? He's got the signature, Paul Paul, whatever it is. And so our brand is everywhere. And we've built and built in concentric circles around where we're based, because where we're based is a pretty wealthy area. It's a high net worth area, it's the London commuter belt. So we know to tap into a local market. I'm not trying to be national. I did try for a while, and then I ended up driving a lot. And it turns out I don't like driving a lot, I like shooting a lot. And if I'm driving a lot, I'm not shooting a lot, so I stopped driving a lot. Similarly with the international weddings thing, I started doing, that was my marketing, international destination wedding photographer. And then I did an international destination wedding. Never again. <laughs> Just because you're in a hot country, in a hotel room, on your own, is not the reason to go travelling. It's not like I was out there doing the trail to some, you know, I wasn't. I was sitting waiting for a cab to pick me up to go to a wedding where I knew nobody, shot the wedding, waiting for the cab to pick me up, take me back to the hotel, waiting for the next cab the next morning to bring me home. That's destination weddings. So I stopped doing all that. I now work in little concentric circles. I don't even advertise 
knowledge of venues more than about 20 miles away. I have two venues and they are within 12, 15 miles. And I like that. But those venues know me really, really well. Now they're good venues. So Le Manoir push me all the time. We're on their list as a guest experience. So those of you who know Le Manoir is two mission star, this way Mont Blanc, who incidentally sang happy birthday to me the other day, just saying. In a white dress with a husky voice, like Marilyn Monroe. Was that how they did it? He did it in a white outfit <laughs> with a husky French accent. I can only imagine. And little to no tuning. <laughs> it turns out the man is genius with a knife, not so much with the vocals. However, uh, what's really nice about that is even the head patron chef of this place knows me well enough that when someone asks him who would take a photograph, he puts them our way. So we have those, that's always been our marketing. The marketing in our, biz, in our business, I'm not particularly gifted at social media, I wish I was, we've talked about this a lot. I find it, I hate Facebook. I, I have this thing about Facebook because I log in and either I'm gonna encounter one or two things that's gonna make me angry. Three things that's gonna make me angry. Possibly four, no one expects a Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Surprise is the first element. <laughs> Um, the first thing that makes it angry is James is much better at it than I am. And that frustrates the crap out of me. The second is that everyone appears to be on holiday and having the most amazing time. And they've got really beautiful toenails in that shot they've taken down their bikini line to their feet. A lot of those. And the third is I get people that say things like, What do you mean you've released the results early? I'm leaving! And I can't be doing with that either. Facebook is full of braggers and slaggers, as far as I can tell, and I hate it. And so I do my best to stay away from it if I can. It's a necessary bit of our business, and lots of people do really, really well at it. And I've tried. I've tried so hard to get into it, and I can't, because if I get, I get it's like a rabbit hole for me. I get in, and then I get sucked in, and I'm either going to be annoyed because everyone else is having a better time than me, or annoyed because their kids are doing better than our kids, or annoyed because people are annoyed. And so I've never found a way, except for employing other people, to do Facebook well. Instagram, on the other hand, we do. So we've got quite a lot of followers on Instagram. I spent years building it up, and only for Facebook to change all the algorithms, which means that the <laughs> tens of thousands of people that follow me, only like a couple of thousand ever get to see a picture, and there's little or nothing I can do about that except pay. But we do that, and what we actually do with that is we show our Instagram feeds on our main website, and the number of people in our area that say, oh, poor, saw that picture you took the other day, amazing by the way. And that's always been our drip feed, so a slightly different drip feed to James's. I think James is right, I think I'm wrong, but I haven't yet found a way of me doing what James does, his involvement with Facebook and social media, that doesn't just break my heart. And so unless I can find that route, I don't know that I'm gonna change it. I think that's the thing as well, is that you can't do it by imitation because people see through it, and we've said this a number of times to each other, that people buy people yeah. in our industry. So if you come across as honest and genuine in your social media feeds, unless you have particularly extremist political views, <laughs> you're going to get across okay to at least the majority of people. The other thing I'd say to put, a, to put a button on what you've said about Facebook and your frustrations with it, there is a mute button, so, you don't have to unfriend people that upset you. You can still be friends with them, you just don't have to listen to them. I'll show you that. <laughs> most people are muted. No, I'm joking. Oh, that, would explain, that would explain why you never answer any of my comments. I've, I've shown you my feet from many and various locations around the world. Yeah. I called myself an international wedding photographer as soon as I shot my first wedding on the Isle of Wight. Who's got another question? <laughs> Hello. Okay, so the question, while well, James picks up the microphone, is uh, about shooting for charities. Uh, Gail says so she gets asked a lot uh, to photograph charities for free. Essentially, what you said? Free. Your, your thoughts? Um, it's, it's a difficult one. It's, it's about picking and choosing the right thing for you. The easiest thing to say, if you don't want to do it, and you feel that you're being, uh, what's the word, not manipulated, but... Exploited. Exploited, thank you. And you feel you're being Good exploited. Word, yes. um, is to, because often it isn't directly for the charity of the event, right? It's like an event that's being organized, and then like it's a tackle, and they're going, oh, by the way, we're supporting something, right? 
The easiest way to get out of it is just say double booked. Oh, I'd love to have done it, but I'm not there. If you didn't want to do it. Sometimes, like, I go back though to the Wayne Gretzky line that I remember, which is, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So if you don't take a chance on something, you are going to miss that opportunity of stuff, other stuff that might happen because of it. And ultimately, if it's a charity that you feel passionately about and that you support, and if it's for a friend, then I would just say, if you can spare the time, do it. Yeah, I mean, we, we are careful with charities because it's very rare that the person contacting me isn't being salaried by the charity. It's funny how the marketing people who work inside the charity are getting a salary, but I'm going to do it for free. Now, they've taken a pay cut to work in the charity sector on the whole, but they're not working for free. So we will generally figure out, if I want to support the charity, this is something I believe in, and we will do it. We give up time in the community all the time. I was with the Scouts last week, risking life, limb and cameras with 35 screaming 12-year-olds. Um, that was kind of curtsy, because that's part of our village community. We give vouchers all the time. So if a charity says, could I do something? If I can and want to, I will. If I can't, we say, look, I can't do that event, but we can give you like a, a, a thousand pound voucher that you can auction off, and then we'll cover it, we'll do the shoot. As long as we get to give you some other vouchers that are only a couple of hundred quid that are a shoot and a frame, so they're extra prizes for you, or you can auction those, and of course they're now lead generators for us, so I'm getting something back out of it. With the hearing dogs, which is kind of, I suspect, where you're alluding a little bit, um, the hearing dogs are a charity that supplies assistance dogs for people who've gone deaf. Uh, except for one famous, very public typo, which read, hearing dogs for dead people. It's hearing dogs for deaf people. Uh, and when I was asked to do this gig, I said, Firstly, I've never showed, photographed a dog in my life, so that's going to be an interesting thing. And the second is, I said, what I'll do is I'll donate half my fees back to you. So effectively, I work at half price. But it sounds a lot better when you add up the fees that, they, that I would have donated. So it's like, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of pounds it is these days. It's quite a lot, because we shoot a lot. And it can't be that many, tens of thousands. Um, so we do that, and in return, I own the copyright on all the images. So I have this vast catalogue that James is right, if you don't shoot it, you don't own it. I do shoot it and I do own it. And this charity have been brilliant. They've given me full rights to all of the images to do what the hell I like with. They're so grateful to have the pictures we're now creating. It's rewritten their brand because I have learned how to photograph dogs. Um, and so that's, that's how that relationship works. They, I'm, doing it, I'm doing it at a rate that competes with all the cheap photographers, but we're, providing, we're producing a quality that they couldn't get hold of if they actually had to go out to the open market and pay. And everyone's a winner, you know? I love the charity and I love the people. It's open doors for us all over the place because they're really well connected. And so in the end, what we've got back out of it is two things. One, a good commercial thing. I am now known as a dog photographer in spite of my better judgment. Um, and the other is that I've got this relationship with this fantastic charity that fundamentally changes people's lives. And I meet these people. And particularly the kids who get a hearing dog if you don't understand, if, you're, if your child's deaf, at night you turn out the lights and take off their hearing. It's silent and it's dark, they don't sleep. So for years, decades, probably longer than that, people think that deaf children have learning difficulties. They don't. They're just tired, scared, and a little bit kind of freaked out by life. A hearing dog arrives in their home and it sleeps beside their bed. The kids sleep, they take their hearing aids out and they sleep. They change from being diagnosed ADHD and problematic and all this kind of stuff to being just normal kids. And so I actually work with this charity that changes people's lives and I love it. And on top of that, we found a back channel where I get something out of it. So if you can find that, that's the trick. You have to believe in the charity. You can't just do it. You, you'll get bitter quite quickly if you just go through the motions and you realize the CEO of the charity is on a six-figure salary and you're giving your time for free. But if you can do it so you get something back out, it's lovely. And I love every second of working with them. I'm delighted the exhibition stands are so busy. <laughs> Take that. Uh, yes, what's another the question? Yes. I was just adding to that. Uh, I did an event with Friday. And I was talking about quoting, but do this event, they came back as a family with their own culture and did. And I said, well, look, I want to do it for a fit. 
well, basically, on the offer you up uh, a price as, as one of the category winners of the SFOs. And, and they went for it. Yeah, so that's yeah. the way. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, at the end of the day, if the, if the charity's making some money out of it, it's, it's amazing what you can do. And you can get stuff back out of it as well. And, and in fact, if your brand is big enough, the charities we give stuff to love having the brand, our brand on their, on their list of prizes because it looks really good for them as well, you know? But we work with local charities, not national. There are a couple of charities I do national work for, and they pay me proper commercial rates. And I work all over the UK at full rates because it's a commercial arrangement. The guys who book me, the agency is doing the design. These are all commercial people, and I'm not going to give up our valuable time on something where there's no real personal engagement from them. It's just, can you provide these pictures? Yes, I can. We, you know, what's the charge? It's this, because we're going to give you pictures that you can plaster everywhere, and they do. So that's slightly different. I'm just like, yeah, what, what really happened was, I just needed to... Talk in the mic. I just needed to find the right words. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Whenever you're taking a booking, if you're taking a booking for a client, they say, oh, uh, uh, no, we need to book in for our baby shoot, when are you free? You go, oh, we got all next week free. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> say, I've got Tuesday at 12 or Thursday at 2. Yeah. Uh, oh, I can only make Thursday at like 4. Oh, we might be able to squeeze you in. Yeah, we can just about squeeze you in. Makes right. you look busy. Yeah. You know, and it, and it makes you fit and makes them feel like, oh, God, they've moved stuff around for me yeah. to get me in there. And then they're not going to cancel because they're going to think, fuck, that, sorry, excuse me. They're going to think, blimey. <laughs> They're going to think, wow, he's, oh god, kids are around here, jeez. Right, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're going to think, wow, they're so busy, and, and that sort of helps your brand. Does anyone have a question about, like, awards and qualifications? Because I think that's kind of what we were supposed to be was it? talking about. I didn't know that. I think. No one told me that. Is it, or does anyone have another question? So it was a Q&A of A&Q? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> anyone else with a question? It must be, you must have questions, that's why you're here. I can't just... Talk, thank you. Wait, Rachel, there's a stooge at the front. Ask away, Rachel. Sorry, what's your name? <laughs> right, I'll repeat the question. Good. Yeah, it's fine. You turn the mic off as you held it, I think. It's just speaking out here. Try it. What, like that? Try the microphone. There. Oh, it is working. You just rubbish the microphone. Fine. So the question was, how do you know which images to pick for your panels, and whether you're ready, I suppose, that kind of thing. James? Um, you ask Kevin Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got I, a question? I have a, I have a, I have a different view to that. You give Kevin Wilson champagne, and then you ask Kevin Wilson. Um, I just found out from what you answered, you was getting that for free. Hey? Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Well, um, you know, it's cost me a fortune in big sympathy. bottles of champagne. Um, I think, like, how can I best describe it? Like, I think you like the so just to just to real clarify the grades that are being marked up there, and the people are putting themselves like, okay, to to to, to just give you a bit of a, a foundation on this, putting yourself up for a qualification is like the most gutsy, ballsy thing you can do in photography, in my opinion. To put your work on big pictures and have them in front of judges, most of which you don't know, is like psychologically, you see, need so much strength to be able to do that. Because there are so many photographers who envelop themselves in their own little bubbles, in their own little groups, and their own little things where they say, you know, I'm brilliant, uh, everything we're doing is brilliant, and they close themselves off to criticism. So anyone that does it has my utmost respect. The licensorship, in my opinion, is where you're showing people I can hold a camera and I'm responsible for charging people money for my work. Okay? That's literally the level you're trying to hit. Your associateship is saying, yeah, I can do all that, but I can do it in a style that's unique to me. I can make everything look like it's kind of like my own thing. My interpretation of the fellowship when I went for it was that you had to do something that wasn't just your best 20 images that you'd shot over the last 10 years. You owe it to yourself to take on a project, to take on something that goes a little bit deeper, that's a little bit more personal, that tells a story, that has a narrative. And that's where craftsmanship comes in. I haven't seen... I'm going to compose myself for this bit. I haven't seen a panel like Imelda's panel up there in years. It is frighteningly brutal, frighteningly honest, and a joy to mentor. It really was, and that's the circle for me is that it comes right back round that I'm helping other people achieve these goals. And that panel, along with another panel um, from Scott Johnson where he went to Auschwitz, 
and did a panel of 20 images on that. Those are the panels that will look as good next year and a decade and long since this room is being filled by other photographers of another generation. And that's the benefit of qualifications. It's like, it's not the ego, it's, it's not the letters, it's the journey and what you do with the skills that you learn along the way. And if there was a perfect point to end this Q&A, <laughs> we probably reached it. But what have you got to say about it? <laughs> <laughs> That's so rude, I apologise. What I will say is there's no way of knowing. You don't know. But there are people around you who will help you know. Mentors, just fellows, judges. You'll, you'll find with a, with a huge degree, a huge degree of certainty that you can ask pretty much any judge to look at your images and they will give you honest and considered feedback. For, they won't charge you, most of them won't charge you. They're just good people on the whole. And what I will say about the fellowship, because this has come up a little bit um, over the past day or three, is for me personally, it's still one of the proudest moments, certainly the proudest moment in my career as a photographer. You know, let's ignore having children and getting married, all those moments that clearly outshine any, all of it. But I, I mean, I cried when I got my fellowship because there were seven or six, seven fellow, as in fellows, capital F photographers, who at the end of the judging process has said, we all agree, we will now consider you to be one of our peer group. Imagine that, imagine being part of Faye Yergri's peer group. That, that was how it was. That made me cry. Um, it made Hank Van Putin cry as well. And he held on to me and we sobbed together long after I'd let go of Hank Van Putin. He carried on holding on to me and crying. It was an interesting moment, my fellowship. Yes, it was one of those. And I carried on like this, looking around the room with Desi and a few others going, because like, Hank, Hank got quite emotional. It's a problem. If you can get to it, it is the best thing in the world because you've put your heart and soul into this. And unlike competitions, which is where we are today, you're not battling it out with other photographers. You're battling it out with yourself, which is why qualifications are so damn powerful. They're your journey. They're not, you know, I could have produced, or any one of us could have produced the best image of our lives over the past six weeks. Entered it, and I've got one like this. It was the best wedding shot I've ever taken. Didn't even get a merit. <laughs> and that's the problem with competitions, is it can be very singularly destructive if you let it be. Because you're competing against everybody else. You don't know how they've done. They may have produced the best image of their lives and you're not going to win anything for the, this amazing image. Whereas when you go for qualifications, it's just you, your pictures, and the judges. And I think there's a purity in that. That's a proper, it's a proper cycle of development, and I love it. I think it's amazing. There really is, and that's the, that is the difference between awards and qualifications, which is where, like, if it wasn't for a combination of Lisa Visa, David Calvert, and Jason Banbury, I'd be erecting shelves in my studio to put all the trophies that I've been shortlisted for. But because of those three photographers, I haven't. Just like that. So, but my, but my fellowship, it's just funny what you say about feeling emotional when you got it, because we had the exact same feelings. Because I'll just give you a quick, like, a quick overview of what happened to me. I, put my, I, I worked on my panel for like pretty much a year of my life, of like travelling to shows up and down the country to photograph the people I wanted to photograph and seeing Kevin and you know like we'd just become a dad and I had a new kid and like sacrificing that and I told my in-laws who were supporting us a little bit that I'm going for this fellowship and it means the world and you're trying to explain to them what it means and they're going so what is it? What do they pay you for it? I'm like no I, I pay them to, to judge me. All right but when, when you win it they'll give you a cheque or something I'm like no I'll just get a, a letter um, but it is worth it, trust me, it is worth it. And then, and then I went and put all my images up in Darlington, the images that I had reprinted twice because I was afraid that a scratch might fail me or a little bit of, you know, a bit of skin tone too dark might fail me. And then you make sure you, you print 21 just in case you scratch one of the prints putting it up so you've got a, 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 you got know, a baker's dozen print there. And then you take a step back at your 20 images, two rows of 10 just before the judges are on the other side of the door waiting to come through and judge your work. And you take it all in and you think, 
I've produced an absolute pile of shit. <laughs> There's no way they're going to pass me on this. Because I'd overlooked it, I'd overthought it, and the pressure of having to go back home and tell my in-laws that it was all a, a waste of time. And then Paul Cooper has the audacity to Simon Cowley when he gives me my result by saying, I'm sorry to say that you're going to have to go home and buy a massive bottle of champagne to celebrate. And by that point, I was past saving. I just collapsed. <laughs> it's the most traumatic experience of my life. Two fellowships. They're good. Yeah, they're very good. Right, nice. <laughs> Raffle? Yeah, raffle. Is, right. Is, is there another quick question while we're having a raffle prize? No, like, let's go with a raffle. Okay. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it interesting or intriguing. And if you have any questions at all, then please do email me. It's paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. That's paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. I can't even say it. I mean, how many years have I been saying this? I've been saying my own email address for the past 10, 11, 12, 13 years. And I'm still getting it wrong. It's Paul at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk. There you go. Uh, straight out there. Right. Uh, some final bits and pieces. Uh, as you hopefully will know by now, myself and Dave Stanbury, a fantastic wedding photographer, just one of my favourite, not just one of my favourite photographers, but one of my favourite guys on the planet. He and I are running a one week trip to Italy, to the Ciccone Castle, this Graffi Studios Castle that's just near to Venice uh, next year. It's going to be from the 25th to the 29th of March. And it's going to be such a good week. The two of us are talking about everything to do with social photography. He's bringing the wedding element to it, though I shoot weddings too. And I'm bringing the portrait element, though he shoots portraits too. And between the two of us, we're just going to spend the whole week enjoying talking about social photography, wedding photography and portrait photography. We're going to do portfolio reviews. We're going to have um, live shooting sessions. We're going to talk about retouching. We're going to talk about marketing. We're going to talk about branding. We're going to talk about workflow. In fact, it's five days of just immersing yourself in social photography. It's going to be amazing and on top of all that it's not like we're doing it in some little hotel just outside Heathrow we are doing this in Graffy Studios Castle up in the mountains above Venice there isn't anywhere more beautiful it's going to be fantastic we're going to be there in March the spring will just be on the turn the air will have that cool cold clarity to it you never know there might still be a little bit of snow up on the tops of the mountains uh, but it's going to be fantastic if you fancy that if you fancy that then please do email um, studio at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk that's studio at paulwilkinsonphotography.co.uk the price for the week is £795 that's the early booking that includes all of your tuition but it doesn't include uh, flights uh, evening meals and your hotel You'll have to source those yourselves. But if you talk to us, we know where everybody's going to be staying uh, and we can put you in touch with the right people. So if you fancy that a week, a total immersion into this craft of social photography, then we would love to have you on board. Uh, coming up just before that, actually, in January, and let me plug in this throughout the next few months is I'm going to be presenting at the SWPP conference. Uh, I'm doing two. I'm doing a masterclass and a superclass. The superclass is on the 18th of January. That's from 9 in the morning till 1 in the afternoon. And we're doing a whole superclass on posing without posing, which is kind of, if you're a people watcher, this is what you're up to. So it's all about taking people's natural ways of standing, natural ways of sitting, the way they move, and turning that into effective posing for portrait photography. Because, of course, if you're anything like me, certainly when I started out I was really nervous about posing people I didn't really know how to guide them and in the end I figured out that actually the best thing for me to do the way I am the way I like to interact with people is to watch them watch the way their body moves watch the way they stand or sit and then just enhance that just change it subtly to get the beautiful poses that we're known for so if you fancy that that's on 18th the 18th of January 2019 nine in the morning till 1 p.m. You have to go onto the Society of Wedding Portrait Photographers and book that one. It's ticketed only. Um, I don't know how much the individual tickets are. The day pass is 200 quid or something uh, to go to as many seminars as you want. But it's a brilliant thing. It'll be amazing to do. It's in Hammersmith in West London. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. On the 19th of January, the following day, I'm doing a two-hour masterclass uh, called From Ingest to Revenue. And that's actually all about taking those images you've shot 
and doing what all of us have to do, turning it into revenue. So it's going to be going through how to take the images onto your computer, how to rename them back in the map, uh, maybe just a little bit of retouching. And then we're going to go through how to present them, uh, how you show them to the clients and how you turn that into revenue, how you turn your skill at taking a beautiful picture and turning that into a business. So both of those out there, hop across to the SWPP, that's the Society of Wedding and Portrait Photographers, uh, for more details. Um, if you've enjoyed this podcast, and I really hope you have, I know this one's slightly different, uh, and hopefully the noise wasn't too distracting, uh, but if you have enjoyed it, then please do subscribe to this podcast, wherever you uh, subscribe to your podcasts, whether it's on, I don't know, Podbean or on iTunes or if you're in the States on Google Play, please subscribe to it so you get the regular updates. Um, alternatively, you can hop across to masteringportraitphotography.com, uh, where all all of the podcasts are available to listen to and download. But if you're on the website, of course, you can also uh, view the articles, listen, watch the videos and Q&As, and there is so much more on there. If you fancy a membership of that, then, of course, we would love to have you. We do like talking to uh, portrait photographers all over the world. So on that happy note, I'm going to head away. I've got a beautiful weekend lined up, a couple of portrait shoots. Then we're off down to uh, Bristol to see some friends and then also see our daughter. Um, and I'm just so excited about that. So until next time, remember, be kind to yourselves. Take care.